Hi everybody and welcome to Tales of Albion, the channel where we try to keep ancient legends and myths alive. Today I'm going to be reading the second branch of the Mabinagion concerning the King of Britain's Bendigaedran, or Bran for short, and his wars in Ireland. Now this is one of my favourites, so stay tuned, don't forget to like and subscribe, and enjoy. Bendigaedran, son of Lear, was crowned king over the island and invested with the crown of London. One afternoon he was in Harlech, one of his courts. He was sitting on the rock of Harlech, above the sea, with his brothers, Menawedin, son of Lear, and his two brothers, on his mother's side, Nisian and Ephnisian. There were many noblemen there gathered with them, as was appropriate around a king. His two brothers on his mother's side were the son of Yoraswith, by his own mother, Penarthin, daughter of Beli, son of Minogan. One of these was a good lad. He could make peace between two armies when they were most enraged. That was Nusian. The other could cause the two most loving brothers to fight, Evnusian. As they were sitting there, they could see thirteen ships coming from the south, heading towards them easily and swiftly, the wind behind them. I can see ships over there, coming boldly towards the shore, said the king. Tell the men of the court to put on their armour, and go find out what their intentions are. The men armed themselves and went down to meet them. As they drew closer, it became certain to the men that they had never seen ships more perfect in condition than these. They were fair, beautiful, with exquisite banners of silk. Suddenly one of the ships overtook the others, and they saw the shield being raised above the ship's deck, with the point of the shield upward as a sign of peace. The king's men began to approach, so that they were within speaking distance, to greet the king. The king could hear them from where he was seated on the high rock above their heads. May God prosper you, he said, and welcome. Whose are these ships, and who is their chief? Lord, they said, Martholoch, king of Ireland, is here, and these are his ships. What does he want, said the king? Does he want to come ashore? No, Lord, they said, unless you grant him his request. He has business with you. What sort of request does he have, says the king? He wishes to unite your two families, lord. He has come to ask for Branwen, daughter of Lear, and if you agree, he wishes to join together the islands of the mighty and island, so that they might be stronger. Very well, he said. Let him come ashore, and we will take advice on the matter. And so his answer was taken to Martholoch, the king of Ireland. I will go gladly, he said. He came ashore and was made welcome, and there was a great crowd in the court that night, what with Martholoch's retinue in the court as well. First thing the next day they took counsel. They decided to give Branwen to Martholoch. She was one of the three chief maidens of the island, and she was the most beautiful girl anyone knew. They set a date for Martholoch to sleep with her in Abba Vrau, and they left Harlech. They all set off for Abu Rao, Martholoch and his retinue and his ships, Bendigaedran and his own retinue over land, until they came to Abu Rao. There the feast began. They sat, and this is how they sat. The king of the island of the mighty, with Manawiddin of son of Lear on one side, and Martholoch the king of Ireland on the other, with Branwen daughter of Lear next to him. They were not in the house, but in the tents, for Bendigaedran had never been able to fit inside of a house, given his large stature. They began the celebration and continued to carouse and converse. When they thought it was better to sleep than to continue carousing, they went to sleep. And that night Martholoch slept with Branwen, and the next day everyone in the court got up, and the officers began to discuss and billeting the horses and grooms. And they billeted them in every region so far as the sea. Then one day, Ephnician, the trickster, the quarrelsome man who we spoke of before, happened upon the lodging of the king of Ireland's horses. And upon asking whose horses they were, the stableman answered, These are the horses of Martholoch, king of Ireland, they said. And what are they doing here? he said. The king of Ireland is here, and he has slept with Branwen, your sister. These are his horses. Is that what they have done with such a fine maiden? And my sister at that? Given her away without my permission? They could not have insulted me more. And so Ephnusian went for the horses. Drawing a cruel knife, he cut their lips to their teeth, 
and their ears down to their heads, and their tails to their backs. And where he could not get grips of their eyelids, he cut them to the bone, and in the way that he maimed these horses so that they were no good for anything. The news reached Martholoch. He was told how his horses had been maimed and spoiled, so they were no good for anything. Well, Lord, said one, you have been insulted, and it was done deliberately. God knows, but I find it strange. If they wanted to insult me, that they should have first given me such fine maiden, of such a high rank, so beloved by their family. Lord, said another, it is perfectly clear there is nothing for you to do but return to the ships, and so Martholoch made for the ships with his men. Meanwhile, news reached Bendigadran that the king of Ireland was leaving the court, without asking and without permission. Bendigadran sent two messengers of high standing, Idig, son of Anarog, and Hivith Hir. These men caught up with him and asked him what was his intentions, and why was he leaving? God knows, he said, if I had known, I would not have come here. No one has ever been on a worse expedition than this, and a strange thing has happened to me. What is this? they said. I was given Bronwen, daughter of Lear, one of the three chief maidens of this island, and daughter of the king of the island and mighty no less, and I slept with her, but then I was insulted, and I find it strange that an insult was done before such an excellent maiden was given to me. God knows, Lord, that insult was not done to you with the approval of one who rules these courts, nor any of the council, and although you consider it a disgrace, this insult and deception is worse for Bendigadran than it is for you. Yes, he said, perhaps so. But yet, Bendigadran cannot undo the insult just because of that. The men returned with their answer to Bendigadran and told him of what Martholoch had said. Well, Bendigadran said, it is no good if he goes away angry. We cannot allow it. We agree, Lord, they said. Send messengers after him again. I will. Arise, Manawadan, son of Lear, and Hivith here, and Iniglau, go after him, and tell him that he shall have a sound horse for each one that was maimed, and also he shall have, as his honour price, a rod of silver as thick as his little finger, and as tall as himself, and a plate of gold as broad as his face, and tell him what sort of man did this, and how it was done against my will, and that a brother of my mother's side did it, and it is not easy for me to either kill him or destroy him. Let Martholoch come and see me, and I will make peace on whatever terms he wishes. The messengers were sent, and repeated those words in a friendly manner, and he listened. Man, he said, we will take counsel. They decided that were they to refuse the offer, they would be no more likely to get further shame than further compensation. So Martholoch made up his mind to accept. They came to the court in peace. The tents and pavilions were arranged as if they were laying out the hall and they went to eat. They sat much as they had sat in the feastings of friendship before, but it seemed to Bendigadran that the King of Ireland's conversation was lifeless and sad. Whereas he had always been cheerful before, he thought that the king was somehow downhearted because of how little compensation he had received for the wrong that was done to him. Sir, said Bendigadran, your conversation is not as good as it was the other night and if it is because you feel your compensation is too little, I shall add to it as you wish, and to-morrow your horses shall be given to you. Lord, he said, may God repay you. I will increase your compensation too. I will give you a cauldron, and the properties of this cauldron is that if you throw one of your men who was killed in it today, then by to-morrow he will be as good as ever, though he will not be able to speak. Martholoch thanked him for that, and was extremely happy on the account of the cauldron. The next day his horses were handed over, so long as there were tame horses to give. The second night they sat together. Lord, said Martholoch, where did you get that cauldron that you gave to me? I got it from a man who has been in your country, said Bendigadran, and for all I know, that is where he found it. Uh, who was this man, Lord? He was called Hassar Hiss Gevnawid, he said, and he came here from Ireland with his wife, Kimite Kiminvoch, 
and they escaped from an iron house in Ireland, where they were made white hot around them, and they fled. I am surprised that you know nothing about it. Oh, I do, Lord, he said, and I will tell you as much as I know. I was hunting an island one day, and at the top of a mound overlooking a lake, known as the Lake of the Cauldron, I saw a large man with yellow hair, coming out with a cauldron on his back. He was huge, a monstrous man too, with evil, ugly look about him. And a woman followed him, and if he were large, the woman were twice his size. And they came up to meet and greet me. Well, I said, how are things going with you? It is like this, Lord, said the man. In a month and a fortnight this woman will conceive, and the boy who is then born of that pregnancy in a month and a fortnight will be a fully armed warrior. And so I took them in to maintain them, and they were with me for a year, and during that year no one objected to them. But from that point on, people began to resent them. Before the end of the fourth month of the second year, they were causing people to hate and loathe them throughout the land, insulting, harassing and tormenting noble men and women. And from this point my people rose against me and asked me to get rid of them. It gave me no choice, either my kingdom or these people. I left it to the council of my country to decide what should be done about them. They would not go of their own free will. They did not have to go against their will because of their ability to fight. And then, in this dilemma, it was decided to build a chamber completely of iron. And so we summoned all the smiths of Ireland to help in this endeavour. Charcoal was piled up on top of the chamber, and the women and the husband and their children were served with plenty of food and drink. And when it was clear that they were drunk, the smiths began to set fires to the charcoal around the chamber, and blew the bellows and they had been placed around the house, each man with two bellows, and they began to blow the bellows until the house was white hot around them. And so the family took counsel in the middle of the chamber, and the husband waited until the iron walls were hot, and because of the great heat he charged the walls with his shoulder and broke through it, and it was only he and his wife who escaped. After that, Lord, I suppose he came over to you. Indeed he did, said Bendigaidvran, and he gave the cauldron to me. And what sort of welcome did you give them, Lord? I dispersed them throughout the land, and they are numerous and prosper everywhere, and strengthen whatever place they happen to be in with the best men and weapons anyone has seen. That night they continued to talk and sing and carouse as long as it pleased them, and when they realised it was better to sleep than to sit, they went to sleep. And so they enjoyed the feast. When it finished, Martholoch, together with Branwen, set out for Ireland. They set out from Abermenai and their thirteen ships, and they came to Ireland. In the island they received a great welcome. Not one man of rank or noblewoman in Ireland came to visit Branwen, to whom she did not give either a brooch or a ring or a treasure, and it was remarkable to see such a thing leaving the court. Furthermore, she gained renown that year, flourished with honour and companions. Meanwhile, she became pregnant, and after the appropriate time had passed, she gave birth to a boy. They named him Gwern, son of Martholoch. The boy was put out to be fostered at the very best place for men in Ireland. Then in the second year, there was a murmuring of dissatisfaction in Ireland because of the insult that Martholoch had received whilst in Wales, and the disgrace he had suffered regarding his horses. His foster brothers and the men closest to him taunted him with it quite openly, and there was such an uproar in Ireland that there was no peace for Martholoch until he avenged the insult. They took revenge by sending Branwen from her husband's chamber, and forcing her to cook for the court. They had the butcher come to her every day, after he had chopped up meat, and give her a box on the ear, and that is how the punishment was carried out. Now, Lord, said the men to Martholoch, Set an embargo on the ships, and the rowing boats, and the coracles, so that no one may go to Wales, and whoever comes here from Wales, imprison them, and do not let them return in case they find out what is happening. And so they all agreed. 
This continued for not less than three years. In the meantime, Ranwen reared a starling at the end of her kneading trough, taught it to speak. She told the bird what kind of a man her brother was, and she brought a letter telling of her punishment and dishonour. The letter was tied to the base of the bird's wing, and it was sent to Wales, and the bird came to this island. It found Bendegeidran in Caer Saint in Arvam, where he sat at the council one day. The bird alighted on his shoulder, ruffled its feathers until the letter was discovered, and they realised that the bird had been reared amongst people. Then the letter was taken and examined. When it was read, Bendegeidran grieved to hear of how Branwen was being punished. There and then it was decided to send messengers to muster the armies of Britain. Then he had the full levy of 154 districts come to him, and he complained personally to them of his sister's punishment. And so the Council of Seven was formed. They agreed to set out for Ireland and leave seven men behind as leaders, together with their seven horsemen and Caradog, son of Bran, in command. Those men were left in Erdinion, and because of that name, Saith Marchog, or the seven horsemen was given to the town where the council took place. Those seven men were Caradog, son of Bran, and Hyvaith Hir, and Enig, Gleo Isquith, and Idig, son of Anarog, and Fodor, son of Erfich, and Ulch Minasgorn, and Chassar Chaisgynwyd, and Pandaran Dyved. Then a young lad was with him. Those seven stayed behind as seven stewards to look after the island, with Caradog, son of Bran, as their chief steward. And so Bendigadran and his army sailed towards Ireland. But the sea was not wide then. Bendigadran's colossal form waded across. There were only two rivers, called the He and the Archen. In later years, the Irish Sea would form, flooding the kingdoms that lay between. And so Bendigadran walked, carrying all the stringed in instruments on his back, and made for the island's shores. Martholoch's swineherds were on the seashore one day, busy with their pigs, and because of that they saw the sea, and they went to Martholoch. Lord, they said, greetings. May Lord prosper you, he said, and do you have any news? Lord, they said, we have extraordinary news. We have seen a forest on the sea, where we have never before seen a single tree. That is strange, he said. Could you see anything else? Yes, Lord, they said. We could see a huge mountain beside the forest, and it was moving. And there were very high ridges on the mountain, and a lake on each side of the ridge. And the forest and the mountain were all moving together as one. Well, said Marthaloch, there is no one here who would know anything about that, unless Branwen knows something. Go and ask her. Lady, they said, what do you think? Though I am no lady, she said, I know what it is. That is the men of the island of the mighty coming over, having heard of my punishment and dishonour. The forest was masts of ships and yardarms, and they move with the mountain. For the mountain is my brother, Bendigadran, the giant. Lord, said the men to Marthaloch, the only advice we can give is to retreat across the levee, and put the levee between you and him, and then destroy the bridges that cross the river. There are lodestones on the riverbed, neither ship nor vessel can sail across, and they retreated across the river, and destroyed the bridges. Bendigadran landed with his fleet, and approached the river bank. Lord, they said, you know the strange thing about this river. No one can sail across it, nor is there a bridge that we can cross. What shall we do? Nothing, except let he who is leader be the bridge of his people. Bendigadran, I will be the bridge, he said. This was the first time the saying was uttered, as it is still used as a proverb this day. Then after Bendigadran had laid down across the river, Hurdles were placed on him, and his men walked atop him to the other side. Then, as soon as he got up, Martholoch's messengers approached him and greeted him and addressed him on behalf of Martholoch and his kingsmen, who, they said, wished nothing but good on Bendigadran. 
and they said, Martholoch is giving the kingship of Ireland to Gwern, son of Martholoch, your nephew, your sister's son, and will invest in him in your presence. Make up for the injustice and injury that was done to Branwen, and make provision for Martholoch whatever you like, either here or in the island of the mighty. Well, said Bendigaidran, if I myself cannot have the kingship, perhaps I should take advice regarding your message. But until a better response comes, you will get no answer from me. Very well, they said. We will bring you the best response we can get. Wait for our message. I will, if you return quickly, he said. The messengers set off for the king. Lord, they said, prepare a better response for Bendigaidran. He would not listen at all to the one we took him. My man, said Martholoch, what is your advice? Lord, there is only one thing to do. He has never been able to fit inside a house, they said. Build a house in his honour, so that there is room for him and the men of the island of the mighty, one side of the house, and for you and your troops on the other. And place your kingship at his disposal. Pay him homage. And, because of the honour in building this house, he will make peace with you. The messengers took the offer to Bendigaidran, and he took advice. He decided to accept, and that was all done by Branwen's advice, because she feared that the country would be laid waste should war take place. The terms of peace were arranged, and the house was built, large and spacious. But the Irish had a cunning plan. They paced a peg on either side of each column of the one hundred columns in the house, and hung inside each bag an armed man. This is when Ephnician, the trickster, entered the house ahead of the island of the mighty. He cast a fierce, ruthless glance about the place, and caught sight of the bags hanging on the pillars. What is in this bag? he said to one of the Irishmen. A flower, friend, he said. Ephnician prodded the bag until he found what felt like a man's head, and he squeezed this head until he could feel his fingers sinking into the brain through bone. And so he left that one and put his hand on the next bag. And, um, uh, what is in this bag? Flower, friend, said the Irishman. And Ephnician played the same game with each one of them, so that not a man was left alive of the entire two hundred apart from one. And he came to that one and asked finally, What have we here? Flower, friend, said the Irishman. And Ephnician prodded the bag until he found the man's head once more. And just as he had squeezed the heads of the others, so he squeezed this one. He could feel the armour of the head in this one. He did not let it go until he had killed him, and then he sang, there is, in this bag, a different kind of flower. Champions, warriors, attackers in battle. Against fighters, prepare for combat. Then the troops entered the house, and the men of the island of Ireland entered the house on one side, and the men of the island of the mighty the other. As soon as they had sat down, they were reconciled, and the boy was invested in the kingship of Ireland. Then, when peace had been made, Bendigaidran called for the boy to come to him, and so the boy went. And everyone saw him and loved him. From Medawidian to Nessian, son of the Oroswith, called the boy to him, and the boy went to him graciously. Why does my nephew, my sister's son, not come to me? said Ephnesian. Even if he were not king of Ireland, I would still like to make friends with the boy. Let him go gladly, said Bendigaidran, and the boy went cheerfully to meet Ephnician. I confess to God, said Ephnician to himself, the outrage I shall now commit is one the household will never expect. And so he gets up, grabs the boy by the feet, and immediately, before anybody could lay hands on him, he hurls the boy head first into the fire. When Branwen sees her son burning in the fire, she tries to jump into the fire from where she was sitting between her two brothers. But Bendigaidran seizes her with one hand, and seizes his shield with the other, 
and so everybody in the house leaps to their feet. Each one took up arms. Then, Morthwit Tillian said, Hounds of Gwern, beware of Morthwit Tillian. And each one went for his weapons. Bendigaidran held Branwen between his shield and his shoulder, and the Irish began to kindle the fire underneath the cauldron of rebirth. And then they threw the corpses into the cauldron until it was full. And they would get up the next morning fighting as well as before, except they could not talk. When Ifnissian saw the corpses, and no room anywhere for the men of the Island of the Mighty, he said to himself, O oh God, woe is me that I am the cause of these mountains of men. Shame on me, he said, unless I can try to save the rest. He creeps amongst the corpses of the Irish, and the two bare-backed Irishmen come up to him and throw him into the cauldron, as if he were an Irishman. He stretches himself out in the cauldron so that the cauldron breaks into four pieces, and his own heart breaks too from the effort, and because of that, such a victory as there was went to the men of the island of the mighty. However, there was no real victory, except that seven men escaped. Bendigadran was wounded in the foot with a poisoned spear. The seven men who escaped were Prideri, Menawidan, Glyphiai, son of Taran, Taliesin, Unnog, Grithiai, son of Muriel, and Halin, son of Gwynhain. Then Bendigadran, and his dying breaths ordered his head to be cut off. And take my head, he said, and carry it to Gwynvrin in London, and bury it with my face towards France. And it will take you a long time. You will feast in Harlech for seven years with the birds of Rhiannon, and you will find the head to be good company, as it ever was when it was on me. And you will stay for eighty years in Gwales in Penvro, and so long as you do not open the door towards Aberhenvelen, facing Cornwall, you can remain there, and the head will not decay. But as soon as you open that door, you can stay no longer. Make for London. Bury the head. Now set off across the sea. Then his head was cut off, and they set out across the sea with the head, those seven men and Branwen the eighth. They came ashore in Aber Abelau in Telebolin. Then they sat down and rested. She looked at Ireland, and at the island of the mighty, what she could see of them. O oh, son of God, she said, woe that I was ever born. Two good islands have been laid waste because of me. She gives a mighty sigh, and with that her heart breaks, and they make a four-sided grave for her, and bury her there on the banks of the Alau. Then the seven men journeyed towards Harlech, carrying the head, and as they were travelled, they met a company of men and a woman. Do you have any news? said Menawidan. No, they said, except that Casawil and son of Belly has overrun the island of the mighty and crowned himself king in London. What happened to Caradog, son of Bran? He was to be chief steward by order of the Council of Seven. Casawalan attacked them. The six men were killed. Caradog broke his heart from bewilderment at seeing a sword killing his men and not knowing who was killing them. Casawalan had made some dark pact. He wore a magical cloak so that no one could see him killing the men. They could only see the sword. Caswalan did not want to kill Caradog. He was his nephew, his cousin's son. But alas... Pandaran Duvad, who was the young lad of the seven, he escaped into the woods, they say. And then they went to Harlech, and they sat down there and regaled with the food and drink. As soon as they began to eat and drink, three birds came and began to sing to them a song. And all the songs they had heard before were harsh compared to this one. They had to gaze far out over the seas to sight, catch sight of the birds. Yet their song was clear, as if the birds were with them and they feasted for seven years. At the end of the seventh year they set out for Gwales in Penvro. There was a pleasant royal dwelling there for them, above the sea, and there was a large hall. Within the hall there were three doors, two open and a third closed facing Cornwall. See over there, said Menowedan. This is the door we must not open. That night they stayed, 
and they contented, and lacked for nothing. And of all the sorrow they had in themselves seen and suffered, they remembered none of it, nor the grief of the world. And there they spent eighty years, so that they were not aware of having ever spent more pleasurable and more delightful a time. It was no more unpleasant than when they first arrived, nor could any one tell by looking at the other that they had aged in this time. Having the head there was no more unpleasant than when Bendigadron had been alive with them. Because of those eighty years it was called the Assembly of the Noble Head. One day, Halion, son of Gwyn, said, Shame on my beard, unless I open this door to find out if what they say about it is true. He opened the door, and looked at Cornwall, and at Aber Henvelen, now known as the Bristol Channel. And when he looked, every loss they had ever suffered, and every kinsman and companion they had lost, and every ill that had befallen them was as clear as if they had encountered them in this very place, and most of all concerning to their lord. And from that moment they could not rest, so made for London with the head. Although the road was long, they came at last to London and buried the head in Gwynverin, and that was one of the three fortunate concealments when it was concealed, and the one of the three unfortunate disclosures when it was disclosed. For no oppression would ever come across the sea to this island while the head was in its hiding place, and that is how the story goes. Their tale is called The Men Who Set Out From Ireland. In Ireland, no one was left alive except for five pregnant women in a cave in the wilds of Ireland. These women, at exactly the same time, gave birth to five sons, and they reared those five sons until they were big lads and their thoughts turned to women and they lusted after them. Then each lad slept with each other's mothers, and lived in the land and ruled it, and divided it between the five of them. And so the five provinces of Ireland still reflect that division. And they searched the country where battles had taken place, and found gold and silver until they grew wealthy. And so ends the second branch of the Mabinogi, and the tragedy of Branwen one of the three principal tragedies that happened to the island of the mighty. Okay, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. That really is quite a dark tale there towards the end. It escapes into all sorts of dreamscapes and who knows what really. But I will say that if you'd like to know more about the deep meaning behind that story, please check out my channel. I don't just read the stories, I also explore the different meanings behind them. Uh, perhaps... <clears throat> This includes exploring the tropes, the characters, and the locations. So if you'd like to know more, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps me as an independent content provider, and it keeps me motivated. So thanks for watching Tales of Albion. See you next time.